Um, what I'm going to do now is hand over to uh, Peter, so Professor Peter Hawkins, who's got many years of experience exploring these areas. And I think the particular thing that I value about Peter's experience is his ability to connect what do we mean by leadership? What do we mean by learning? What do we mean by culture? And how do these things interlink? Um, so I'm really looking forward to today's session and I hope you'll enjoy it. Peter, over to you. Thank you very much, Chris. And uh, good uh, early morning to friends in America. Good afternoon to friends in Europe and um, good evening to uh, anyone who's joined from uh, the Asia Pacific area. Uh, delightful to be doing another of, the, of this series with GP Strategies. This is the third uh, webinar we've done in this series and there's one more to come in July. Uh, the first one was on how do we create purpose-driven organizations? The second on how do we manage culture to change and this third one kind of follows on partly from that which is how do we create a shift in the leadership culture to create a shift in the organizational culture to deliver the strategy and meet the changing needs of our time so i'm just going to give a quick summary of what we covered in those earlier ones but please do go back and listen to the recordings um, and hopefully this will whet your, whet your appetite if you didn't manage to hear those two previous webinars. And also, please do come and join us on the fourth webinar in July, when we talk more about leadership, the challenges for leadership and leadership development. So we started on the very first of these webinars talking about this formula. Uh, it comes from Reg Revens, the founder of Action Learning. And that is saying that if the organization is not learning faster than the environment is changing, then it's on the Darwinian road to extinction. Arguably, this is the most important competitive advantage for any organization, whether it be in the commercial sector, the organizational, uh, the, 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 the public sector, or the for benefit or not for profit sector. And one of the things we know is the environment is changing faster and in more complex ways than ever before. So we talked on each of the previous two webinars about given the world's changing faster, then our strategy needs to change quicker. To deliver our strategic change, we have to deliver the culture difference that needs to happen. And we quoted the famous Peter Drucker phrase, the culture will always eat your strategy for breakfast. It's easier to change your strategy than it is to develop your culture. And I also mentioned, and it's very relevant to today, that if you want to change the culture, you have to shift the leadership culture. That the collective leadership get the culture they collectively behave. And so in many ways, these three aspects are intertwined. And for many organizations, they call in a, a big consultancy to help them with their strategy, a Baines or a McKinsey. They call in OD people to help them with the culture. They call in a business school or a GP strategies or another consultancy to help them with their leadership development. And they fail to recognize that the real challenges lie in how we join these three up. How do we get these three working together in the spaces between them? In the last webinar, please do go back and, uh, and, and listen to it. We talked about the uh, GP model, which was developed by Bath Consultancy Group originally on the five levels of culture. How culture often is described as it's how things are done around here. But, but culture is not just in the espoused culture of the organization, in its artifacts, its mission statements, its vision, its logos. It's not just its patterns of behavior. It's the whole way of thinking, the whole way of, of, of relating, and the whole way of motivations and assumptions that drive the patterns of behavior. And we talked a little and gave some examples of how do you shift that organizational culture. And uh, as we move on today to organizational learning, you could say that the organizational learning takes place in the way all these three are connected. So the hallway 
organizational learning isn't about our strategy, but it's about how we do our strategizing. Organizational learning is about how do we become aware of the culture that we're immersed in. In the last webinar, we quoted the last one to know about the sea is the fish. Because it's very hard to see the culture you're immersed in. So organizational learning is about how do we develop that reflective ability to become a flying fish and see the culture we're immersed in. And organizational learning is about how do we develop the, the leadership capacity, not only to run the business of today, but to grow the capacity and grow the business of tomorrow that tomorrow's world needs. And how do we have a learning process that attends to the joins between strategy, culture, and leadership? And that's very much what we're going to be addressing today. So we started off in webinar one to talk about purpose-driven organizations that, that, that are focusing on future back and outside in. What is it our stakeholders need from us as an organization? How do we create value for our customers, our customers' customers, our suppliers and partners, our employees, our investors, the communities where we operate, and the more than human world of our environment. And then also, how do we do that in a future back way where we're thinking about not just the customers of today, but what does the world of tomorrow need us to grow into? And these are very important starting places for any organizational learning. We talked about the difference between a mission, which is about capturing the, the organization's ambition and a vision about what success would look like, and, and, and a company's purpose, which is all about how do we create value for the world beyond us. And uh, we talked about why purpose-driven organizations were more important and, and what was the purpose of a purpose. How it means we, we create shared meaning, which is essential to developing the culture. How it attracts and energizes employees and creates the climate we want. How it aligns the shared value that we're creating and, and the interests of the different stakeholders. How it unites the passion and the creativity that inspires people to, to innovate and do more. Uh, how, how it builds partnership across the boundaries, not just inside the organization, but how do we involve our customers and our suppliers and our investors in being partners in, in achieving that purpose, not just recipients of what we do. And um, how it provides a galvanizing attractor for aligning these three aspects. And uh, if we come back to that original formula about the need to learn faster. So this is happening on many levels. It's happening at the individual level, the team level, and the organizational level. Uh, there's much written about how what we learn in college today is out of date, often before people have even finished their degree. And uh, how do we have to recognize that in today's world, it's no good just learning at the start of your career and then applying that for the rest of your career. But often you're going to be going through having to totally rethink your role, rethink the work you do, make it future fit for a new time several times in your career. So part of an organization's key responsibility is to build learning agility for, for all the employees so that they love learning and recreating themselves. Themselves. To be able to do that for all the teams within the business and to do that for the organization as a whole. And how do we have the fourth level of the organization learning in dynamic relationship to all of its stakeholders? How is it learning at its boundaries? How is it using all of its interfaces with its investors, its customers, its suppliers as learning opportunities? And therefore, how do we recognize that today, the, the average length of a company being successful is getting shorter and shorter? Um, there's some very interesting statistics on, on the life cycle of companies. 
and how long companies stay as a member of the Fortune 500 or the FTSE 100. And, and what really determines the ability to stay as a successful company is that ability to constantly learn and reinvent itself. So I've just um, published a, a chapter in a new handbook that's come out called the Oxford Handbook of Organizational Learning. And then I go right back to Gregory Bateson's work in the 1960s and the 1970s, where he first devised the notion of thinking about levels of learning. And he applied this not only to individuals, uh, which got popularized by Chris Ardris and Donald Schoen in single loop and double loop learning, but also to organizations, also to natural systems. Um, how do natural systems learn? And in that, if we apply those four levels, which I do in this chapter, to thinking about organizational learning, so often we reduce learning to thinking about what he would describe as zero learning or, or, or level zero. And this is the organization collecting more and more data. In the world of AI, we can become data rich and learning poor. We get more and more feedback from our customers, competitor analysis, pestle analysis, political, economic, social, technological, legal, environmental trends. Uh, what, what's employee feedback coming constantly with pulse surveys, engagement surveys, performance data on every aspect of our business feedback processes, functional reports, until we become flooded with data. That does not create learning. It creates a foundation we can use for learning, but it can also drive out learning. What Basin describes as learning level one is the, all, he says all real learning is what he describes as stochastic. It happens through experimentation, trial and error and follows the action learning cycle. So real learning only happens when we take some of that, that data, make some choices and try out something new and then reflect on that learning. So level one learning would be how we, how we got an organization that is constantly innovating, constantly doing tactical adjustments, um, seeing what worked, what didn't work, doing after action reviews, uh, constantly so that you know a week doesn't go by for every team when they haven't tried out a new experiment a new piece of innovation and indeed many of the organizations we work with now in their appraisal of staff they have kind of two levels one is have you delivered on the basics of your job what performance delivery have you done the second section is, and what processes and products and ways of operating have you improved? Um, so that's the whole learning level one. It's, it's about that constant innovation cycles and how do we create a culture which encourages that in an organization? Because this, is, this needs to be an organization that can fail fast can risk trying new things, is not just turning the handle. Learning level two is the ability in terms of set theory to look at how we are doing learning level one and how we're doing learning zero. The ability to helicopter up and be on the balcony and, and watch our processes of learning. Uh, Ardris and Shun talked about deutero learning our ability to change how we learn as a team or an organization or individual. So one of the things I've written about in team coaching, my book Leadership Team Coaching, is about how we grow the learning capacity of every team. So the ability to look at not only how we're learning and the processes of learning and of strategizing, not just to revisit our strategy, but to revisit our strategizing process. And how do we look at what are the limiting mindsets and assumptions that are restricting us from the processes of learning? 
But even that in today's world is not enough. And learning level three, which Gregory Bateson said is, is much rarer in the human species um, than, than it needs to be, is about the organization being able to look at how does it transform itself? How does it do a fundamental metanoia to be future fit? How does it undertake organizational transformation? Um, and this is how does it embrace fundamental change collectively and joining up change in its strategy, its culture, and its collective leadership, all based on what do we need to do to be future fit? So learning level three is, is, is a fundamental shift in identity of, of, of the individual, the team, or the organization in service of a future wider purpose. Now, if we take that kind of framework and look at, well, how do we operationalize that? How do we make that something practical? In the chapter, I talk about seven key learning processes. Some of these I've already kind of um, given hints about earlier in this talk. Um, no, number one, future back learning. How do we not just learn by spending our time reflecting on what has happened with after action reviews, but do preflection as well as reflection? How do we, as Otto Sharma and, and Karen Korfer talk about, how do we lean into the future? How do we see what's coming over the horizon? Bill Sharp, in his very good little book on future foresight, on um, three horizons thinking, says all leadership today needs to be able to operate in three time horizons. Operating the business of today, business as usual, innovating for tomorrow, the, the, the level one learning that I've talked about, and level three, which is future foresight. What is going to be coming over the horizon that we need to prepare ourselves today for in order to be ready for tomorrow? And, and what Bill Sharp so well shows is that you can no longer, in today's world of quantum change, go horizon one, horizon two, horizon three. You have to go horizon one, then into future foresight and do your innovation out of the future foresight, not out of how do we get better and better at playing today's game. And ask the question, what is tomorrow's game and how do we get ready to play that? So that also is really important. So if we look at leadership development, and I was first in leadership development all 30 years ago, 40 years ago, most leadership development was being sent off to, to colleges to study case studies about what made yesterday's leaders successful, not what the challenges the collective leadership of tomorrow needs to step up to. It was all done through, through looking backwards, not looking forwards. And that's beginning to change. But even today, a lot of leadership development is about what are the challenges of today rather than what are going to be the challenges of tomorrow. And interestingly, when I've done work with uh, leaders recently through GP Strategies or Henley Business School or Renewal Associates, and I've asked them to look at how much of their time senior leaders are spending in business as usual, innovating for tomorrow and future foresight, and then what they think they need to be spending in terms of their percentages of their weekly work. Nearly always senior leaders are saying, I'm not spending enough time on Horizon 3, right? Because I'm being swamped by the urgent, by the, the immediate, by the things that come over my desk. We spend a lot of time helping them to, to free up, to be able to, to be radical weeders of business as usual. Because you'll never plant, you'll never be a successful gardener if you don't weed out the, the, the urgent issues that grow as fast as the weeds in my garden? Um, and how do they learn to be radical delegators? How do they become in, 
key investors of time. Just recently, Chris and I were working with one of the big four professional services firms. And there was a lovely moment where these quite senior partners who have global roles were saying, we are so time poor, we can't, we can't make the changes. And uh, always being challenging, I said, you're not time poor. You have as many minutes and as many seconds in every day as everybody else in the world. You're not time poor, you're choice rich. And that became a, a, an immediate reframe for them to think about what investment decisions were they making about the precious commodity of time they've been given. And, and that's something that all leadership needs to do. The second is outside in learning. How do we have an organization where we recognize that every employee, every contractor, needs to be an environmental scanner. Engaging and seeking feedback daily, hourly, from customers, potential customers, suppliers, investors, potential employees, the people you try and recruit to then decide not to come and work with you. How do you get feedback from them about what put them off, about your culture, from competitors, from what I now call collaborators, people we have to both compete with and collaborate with, industry forums. But the secret is, is what are the main pathways to take all that environmental scanning back into the organization? How do we harvest the thousands of touch points that the people in our organization have every day with that wider stakeholder community. And how do we turn that into stakeholder intelligence? I, I, I remember asking way back in the 1990s, a very large financial investment company we were working with. They, uh, they were a major investor in Mori. So they had questionnaires coming, coming out of their ears. You know, they had so many. And I said, how do you put that all together and get a real 360 degree feedback on you as an organization? They said, what do you mean? They said, you know, the HR looks after the employee feedback. The FD looks after the investor feedback. Uh, the, 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 um, the investors look after the feedback from the investor companies. All of their stakeholder information was siloized and not connected. That was fundamentally limiting their organizational learning. And very few companies do that well. So if we then move on to uh, learning process three, team of teams learning. Uh, I do recommend, I think I mentioned on the last one, uh, John McChrystal's book called Team of Teams, where he, for his uh, sins, was left being the leader of the Allied forces in post-war Iraq, um, where more people died the year after the war than died in the war. And uh, he suddenly woke up to realize he had the best equipped, best trained, best paid um, allied forces that had ever been assembled anywhere in the world. And yet they were being totally outmaneuvered by small amateur cells of terrorists. And what he realized is that they had very strong teams right across all the allied forces, but there was not the same learning and join up and trust between teams as there was in teams. And, and we've used some of his stories to say, look, it's really important we don't just do team learning in number four, but we also bring teams together to look at the connections between teams. I'll give you one example. Going back to the uh, private equity firm I worked with in the 90s, they said, look, we've got so much great practice going on in different investment teams in around Europe, around the UK, out in Singapore. But, you know, people aren't, it, it's all very isolated. And in their culture, most of those teams saw the other teams in the company as their major competitors. They were competing, you know, the Manchester investment team were competing with the Edinburgh one, who were competing with 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 uh, Frankfurt in 
who were competing with Munich and Milan. And I said, well, you know, how are you going to shift? So there's really fantastic learning between teams. And uh, I couldn't believe it, but the senior leader said to me, oh, what we'll do is we, we as the people who go out and meet these teams, we'll spot good practice and we'll issue best practice documents so that the learning gets spread right across the organization. So I simply said, where have you seen that work? And they, they struggled to come up with an answer. So I said, well, look, given that you've got a fantastic um, competitive spirit in your organization, why don't we launch a prize for the team in the organization that still does the best stealing of learning from another team? And we define stealing as taking an idea from another team, improving on it, and making it their own, and make it even more successful than the people they stole it from. This really engaged the competitive spirit of the organization, and suddenly, we had people competing to steal learning from each other, rather than it coming as a cascade from headquarters. So I think we've got to be a lot more creative about how do we get fast. Uh, I sometimes use the, um, the phrase bubonic plagiarism. How do we get that spirit of, of horizontal quick learning between people, but not just learning one team to another, but teams coming together to discover what can we do together we can't do apart. How do we get that middle join up right across an organization? Number four, I've written a lot about in leadership team coaching and leadership team coaching practice. How do we build core learning into teams so it becomes part of what we do every day? Uh, so team learning is a key aspect. Again, let me give you a quick example. That, that same private equity company, they said, oh, we don't have time for feedback. We don't have time to, uh, to um, learn from each other. So I got to be a bit more creative. They, we discovered that they regularly went out in pairs to present to people, to talk to investing companies, to investigate new investments, to talk to investors. And they traveled in a taxi or a train or an airplane. So what we introduced with them was, was what they, they termed, and they, they came up with this term and this method, the be brief debrief, that after every joint meeting, within seven minutes, they would do a process of each one giving feedback to the other. This is what I think you did well. This is what I think you could have done even better. This is what I think I did well, what I think I could have done better. This is what I think we did well between us. And that became a new learning habit that took no extra time from the day, but became a constant source of, of, if you like, learning level one, upgrading their individual engagement skills and their co-leadership skills. Now, number five, um, at a very basic level, I, I remember working with a big manufacturing company and they realized that they were a uh, turning the handle company rather than a, a learning and innovation company. The first thing they did is they gave every single employee in this very large engineering company an individual learning budget. And for the first year, they said, please work out something new you want to learn this year and, and we'll pay for you to go on that course. It could be photography, it could be tennis, it could be anything. Because what they realized is they wanted to, first of all, get everyone into the habit of being a lifelong learner. And then gradually they moved into how do we then build everyone having a learning development plan and not just an annual one. And increasingly what we've done in GP Strategies is we've helped uh, people develop their learning and development plan, not out of you know, what do they want to learn and develop, but what is it their colleagues, their direct reports, their customers, the people above them need them to develop? How do we do that outside in and future back? Um, and, and, and a lot about uh, uh, how do we make sure that people who go for coaching, and we'll say a bit more about that this in the second half, that, that their coaching agenda doesn't come from what they want from coaching 
but what the world around them needs them to learn and develop to be future fit. Uh, level six, interfunctional relationship learning. How do we make sure, you know, the number of organizations we go into who you ask, so what's holding you back from, from really developing as an organization will say, because we're so siloed. Now to shift silo thinking often starts from having a leadership team that don't just represent their function, but together hold the interconnections between all the different functions an organization has to do. But also we need to create that interfunctional learning in activities and processes in the middle of the organization where issues between marketing and production don't go all the way up the, the marketing hierarchy across the top of that down again. But there is a whole culture where if you've got an issue with another department, you resolve it directly. Don't send it up and down vertical lines. When we completed the, the research on tomorrow's leadership, uh, it became more and more clear to us that tomorrow's leadership is not a, so much about the vertical, about how do I manage people above me and the people beneath me, my, my, my team, my function, my organization. More and more, we're leading less people because organizations are employing less employees, but we're having to do more partnership horizontally across the organization and across all our stakeholders. And finally, number seven, unlearning. Most of us are much better at learning new things than unlearning what made us successful yesterday. And one of the, one of the difficulties for us to, to uh, come to terms with is the more successful you are at something, the harder it is to unlearn. Because yesterday's success is addictive. So unlearning is what do we need to let go of? What do we need to give up in order to move on to the next level? Uh, we've been working for many years with Bill Torbett's levels of maturational leadership, the different action logics. And many organizations try and work to help some of their their technician expert, functional managers and leaders become achiever leaders. And uh, one of the difficulties is that uh, the technicians experts will say, please tell us the seven things I need to do to become an achiever leader. And uh, when I'm being very provocative, my response always is, well, step one is to stop asking that question because you won't get to being achiever leader through a technician expert seven step training course. So what we, we need to do is we need to use confounding experiences to help place ourselves in situations where yesterday's successful strategies no longer work. So a number of organizations we've been working with have been using immersion training. I was with a, a global COO yesterday and they were saying how they they send people out on immersion training to, um, to, to work in slums in India where they have seven days and they have a major project and they just cannot deal with it. They have to partner with the local people to make this project successful. They're outside their comfort zone. Their normal ways of managing will not work. So they're, they're being confounded in a way that shifts their whole leadership consciousness. And this becomes very important. So. Um, that's a very uh, quick run through. So let me take a pause before I give examples of where we've used this in organizations. And uh, Chris, what sort of questions have come in? Uh, well, <clears throat> we, we don't have too many questions just at the moment. So my encouragement again to everybody is um, to, to put some questions either into chat or Q&A. And you'll find the, the buttons to access those at the bottom of the screen. You'll see a little speech bubble, which is the uh, chat one and the little uh, Q&A which says Q&A. Um, but a, a question, Peter, that uh, is in my mind that links, I think, a little bit to unlearning um, and, and for me is around how do you help leaders shift their mindsets? Um, 
So I, let me give an example. I, I spoke and worked with a senior team in one of the big banks uh, who had been through what sounded like a fantastic uh, kind of uh, development program. So they'd been sent out to the U US, uh, this is the UK based bank, they'd been sent out to the US to get some, some deep thinking around the impact of digitization and how it's going to impact the financial services sector and, and really try to sort of open up their eyes to the, the rate of change that's happening around them. And then they spent some time looking at data and how you can manipulate data, data and visualize data uh, with working with one of the big universities. And they spent some time looking a bit at themselves and, and where they are and what their thinking is. So it sounded like a great experience. I had a sense of why am I talking to these guys? Um, I was working with this, this, this senior team as a team. And one of the things that they were sort of saying was, we get it. Intellectually, we get it. The way in which the financial services sector is changing and so on. Um, but actually, we're not experiencing it in our day-to-day, -day, you know, what we're leading and managing here and now. So, so in a sense, they were, they were sort of intellectually getting it, but that, that shift into action, yes. so what can we do about it, was just, they were kind of stuck around that. They had a sense of, we sort of understand it, but we're not, we don't see the urgency to respond now. And clearly the organization thinks, yeah, there is a need to respond now. And I just wonder, you know, that sort of sense, there's something there about unlearning, there's something there about, you know, mindset shift. Any perspectives, any thoughts that might, might link to that? Well, as you were talking, Chris, I was thinking that one of the biggest difficulties is that people still think that learning is knowledge acquisition mm -hmm. and that learning happens in the left hemisphere neocortex yeah whereas if we go back to gregory bates and he'd be saying all learning is is embodied and we could go off on courses we could go to singularity university we could we can learn lots about the future with our left hemisphere neocortex but 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 unless we take into embodied learning it will not shift our way of being hmm. and, and i just think you know if, if you take your notion about um learning about big data and digitalization somewhere what we've got to do is we've got to give people um a, a, an embodied experience of the future not just knowledge about the future hmm. so you know where would i start thinking i would start thinking by how can we we run a a um, laboratory simulation of them having as a team to make decisions when they're being data flooded? Mm -hmm. um, how are they going to make in real time choices about what to attend and what not to attend to? Mm. Um, and 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 with real time pressure to have to to. to Firstly, what am I going to take on around the data, and how am I going to join the data up? Yeah. yeah. So, so we are training that, um, uh, that, that those those ways of being, which has an interperson, an, uh, a person data interface, and a person -to person face. Yeah. 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 And, you know, it's like this phrase I had in the research where one CEO said to me, "Look, Peter, I've got." I've got lots of people who coach my individuals and lots of people who who consult parts of the organization, but all my challenges don't lie in the people, the parts, they lie in the connections. Mm -hmm. yeah. So how would we design something that forces them to, to make connections in new ways and choices in new ways yeah. under pressure? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, that makes a great deal of sense in that context. And one of my observations was, you know, they'd gone through this process individually, you know, in collaboration with people from other parts of the organization. But then as a team, they needed to then, and in a sense, yeah, I think that's exactly what you're saying is, you know, as a team, how are they going to get together and respond in the context of their market? Um, I think that makes makes good sense. My my other quick observation, I guess, is uh, the link between individual and sort of collective or organizational learning. Um, one of the things I notice is, you know, with the increasing focus on learning, digital learning of one sort or another, so digitally uh, kind of accessed learning, is that that almost puts you increasingly into an individual mindset and a knowledge acquisition or maybe a bit of skill mindset rather than that broader kind of connected learning space. Yeah, and and um, 
I also put, put this reference um, on available for the people who listen to the recording as well as the people today. The book by Sloman and Fonfax about um, how we think we know a lot more than we actually know. Um, because a lot of what we know is we don't know, but our network knows. We think we know it because we have access to that, that knowledge. And so even at that level, a lot of learning is, is relational and networked, not inside the individual. And the problem with a lot of e-learning is we're still working on knowledge banking and that, knowledge, that learning lies within the individual and within the individual's neocortex. And, and, and that's not how it works. And, and there's also been a bit of question I see, Chris, about can we put the reference for the Oxford Handbook of Organizational Learning, um, which is just coming out. So I'll make sure that we put that reference up as well. It's either just published or just about to be published. Okay. Yes, I'm sure we can do that. Absolutely. Great. So shall I go on and just share a little about some of the ways that you've worked with this? Thanks, Chris. So um, three approaches. We've done a lot of work with organizations on how do we create a coaching culture. And because my original research way back in the 80s, um, which I did for my doctoral research, was on organizational learning. This was the pre-Peter Senge days. Um, I've done a lot to look at the, the, how, how coaching culture and, and, and an organizational learning culture are, are linked together. Secondly, we'll look at how do we link leadership development and organizational development. Um, how do we see those not as separate uh, um, silos, but how do we realize that your leadership development should be a, a driver of your organizational development and your organizational development should be some of the, the challenge and fuel that drives your leadership development? And uh, finally, we'll also look at what do we need to do to, to develop the internal resources, whether that's a uh, your internal coaches, your HR people. Um, how do we develop the, 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 the learning enablers within an organization, including how do we develop leaders to realize that one of their most important responsibilities as a leader is to develop the leadership of tomorrow? So how do we recognize that every, every leader is a leadership developer? And uh, so Let's start off just by looking at the coaching culture. I did a book in 2012 called Creating a Coaching Culture, where we interviewed a lot of organizations around the world. And uh, there's a lovely moment where I asked this uh, HR director who was telling me about her, uh, what, how much coaching was going on. She said, look, we've got an uh, external panel of coaches we use globally. We've got an internal coaching community. We're training our managers in coaching skills. It's fantastic. I said, that's great. I said, so how many coaching conversations do you have every week? She said, there must be hundreds of them. And I said, well, so how does your organization learn from those thousands and hundreds of coaching conversations? And she had no answer. So one of the things about creating a coaching culture is to realize that a coaching culture is not just an organization where lots of coaching happens. It's about how do we how do we set the agendas for that coaching so that they are delivering value not just to the individual but to their team, their employees, their stakeholders, and how do we harvest the learning that goes across all those coaching conversations? Here we we developed the notion that um, if you want to create value in your organisation, it goes back to being purpose led. And you want to create shared value, you have to shift stakeholder and public perceptions and engagement. And that means we have to shift our customer experience. That means we have to shift all those touch points of engagement with our customers and stakeholders, what we call the live brand. And what we know is our frontline staff, engaged customers and stakeholders, how they do that is most effective not by going on training courses, but how they are directly managed by their, their direct, direct line manager. We also know that how those managers 
interact with the, the, the frontline staff is most effective not by what they've been taught on management courses, but on how they are led by the people who are their direct leaders. So that means we have to shift the leadership culture, to shift the organizational culture, to shift the stakeholder engagement, to shift the, the customer experience and eventually the shared value. And uh, therefore, we, we need to, to see coaching is not just a matter of having lots of, of activity, but how do we link the coaching that goes on to, to what is the learning the organization needs to be future fit? What's the development it needs in its, its strategic culture and leadership outcomes? Um, how do we build that into how we, we measure the outcome of coaching, not just measure did the, did the coaches like their coaches? But also, and this is something we've developed for a number of organizations, how do we bring together coaches to respect the confidentiality of individual coaching, but to share what are the cultural themes that are coming up across the coaching conversations? Because it's never, as I said in a talk last night, there is never just two people in a coaching conversation. Because the individual who comes for coaching is carrying within them the team dynamic the functional culture, the organizational culture, the, 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 the systemic dynamics of the stakeholder contention, all of that is showing up in the coaching room, but often does not get listened to or attended to. So we've worked with several organizations in, in bringing together the, the coaches, the supervisors of the coaches, and, and, and preserving individual confidentiality, but finding ways of mapping and listening to how the culture is showing up and how the, the, the accelerators and interrupters to strategic change and organizational learning are showing up in individual coaching and the team coaching. And then finding ways of creating a generative dialogue between the senior leadership and the people who are harvesting that learning from the coaching community. Um, in the book, we talk about um, the, the, the whole stages that often organizations go, go, go into in developing coaching in their organization. And, and a number we've worked with have, have done a lot of investment in external coaching provision. Step two, they've developed an internal coaching capacity. Uh, uh, they've got good support from the leadership. Um, but if you Stop at that point. The danger is you've done a lot of investment, but what you've done is probably very expensive personal development for the already highly privileged. To quote a story that I came across, to be like I got from a very young black frontline manager in South Africa, who said, It sounds like to me the people with the big paycheck. The big cars, the big offices, now get the big coaches. And it was his phrase. This sounds like very expensive personal development for the already highly privileged. And, and that's why it's really important we don't stop at that point. We start to look at how do we build coaching in, into the different aspects of what we do? How, in the way we do appraisals, do we have a, a, a coaching style of doing those, a developmental style? And how do we make sure that at the end of every appraisal, there's some upward feedback to the appraiser? This is what's been really helpful about that con this conversation, and this is what could have been even more helpful next time. And how do we get that linkage between coaching activity and organizational learning? Um, how do we build a coaching approach into teams? And also, how do we build this into the seventh stage, which is the least developed, into how we partner with our stakeholders? So increasingly, we've been doing a lot of work coaching partnerships and coaching the, across the boundaries of the organization, the organization working with its customers on designing its better products and processes, working with its suppliers on how we how we manage the, the supply chain better in ways that are not more just more efficient, but are more 
ecologically friendly? How do we work with our investors on, on taking the company forward? And, and the first step when we bring a coaching approach to that is you, you never start by asking the different partners to partnership, what do you want from each other? You start by asking, what is it you can do together that you cannot do apart? You start by asking, what is, what is it that your partnership is there to serve? And what do the stakeholders of your partnership need from both of you? I'll give one example. Um, Chris and I have been working with, uh, through GP Strategies, with a major financial merger. So I'll just go back one so I don't distract you. And, and they said, look, would we come in and help them with their cultural merger? And I said, yeah, we'd love to do that. I, and they said, well, you see, we're trying to create an organization that has the best of both. My first response was, I wouldn't start with that way of thinking. So Chris, this goes back to your mindset shift. Sometimes we have to step in quite quickly and, and, and offer a reframe. And the reframe was to say, look, rather than ask, how do we have the best of both? Because that way, you'll end up spending two years competing with each other on who has the best HR, who has the best IT who has the best market intelligence, who has the best investors, who has the best products on, on A or B or C. I said, we have to ask the question, what is it your new merged company can do uniquely that the world of tomorrow needs that neither of you could have done in your individual companies? What is it the two of you need to give birth to which is needed by the future world? By changing that frame, we suddenly had a different of learning going on because that was future back and outside in not let's have a negotiation about who's got the best of what so uh, if i go on to the next one this is a case study of, of combining um, leadership development and organization development this is working with ernst and young the case study is published we can also give you that reference um, and, and basically, they, they said, would we come in and help with partner development? And we said, well, we don't do leader development. We don't, we don't develop partners. We're willing to help you do, do leadership development. But only if that means we can work with you really getting the articulation of what needs to shift in your organization to be future fit. What does that mean you need to shift to the leadership uh, in, in the organizational culture, therefore, what do you need to shift to the leadership culture? And, and interestingly, again, just to um, uh, give one example of how you do the mindset shift, we discovered that uh, you know, if, if this was a, a program that was just organized by HR, that the level of people turning up and, 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 and not being distracted by client calls would be very low. So we paradoxically said, look, he said this program is compulsory. It went to 550 partners in the end. But we said you can only come on it if you identify an internal and an external relationship that you need to handle better, which has commercial implications for your organization. Right? And then at the end of the program, you want to be able to handle better. This immediately put them into a paradoxical double bind. They could say, oh, this is soft, touchy stuff, because we said, you know, you've had to identify relationships that have a commercial impact on your organization. Right? So, so we, were, we were holding them in something that really made a difference and joined that the commercial strategic needs, the cultural change shift, and the individual learning. And indeed, as part of that, we, not, we worked with them, giving them real challenges on what they were going to shift to their organization and how they were going to become cultural change elements, uh, agents. And then finally, just to give a very different case study, we, uh, again, it's in the public domain, so we can talk about it. We, we worked back in 2008 with the Department of Working Pensions when they were having to reduce their number of employees from 130,000 down to about 
98,000, and at the same time had more pensioners, more unemployed, more disabled people, and were having to increase the quality of work. To do that, we not only had to work with the top team, we had to grow their internal resource and get them to think differently about not just putting on programs, but how do we become organizational learning enablers? So we worked across the, the internal LAD, the HR folk, the, the leadership, and got them working together in terms of how do we become the orchestrators of learning at the individual level, the team level, the organizational level, and the wider ecosystem level. And that's where I think the work becomes really uh, not only um, powerful, but, but really exciting to be doing and, and has a real sustainability to it. So just let me just end my just saying a couple of things. Let's you want to say this, Chris, about how GP works with clients. No, feel free to go ahead. Um, so I've already mentioned a few key elements. We don't do leader development, only leadership development, which is developing not just the leaders, but the space between the leaders is developing collective leadership of leadership teams and the leadership culture linked to what does the future and the outside need to shift in the organization, therefore need to shift in the culture, and therefore shift in the leadership culture. And then also, the other kind of really important thing is how do we realize that whatever happens on programs or team coaching needs to be really aligned to how that learning continues and gets embedded back at work. Because too many leadership offsites have lots of great energy and enthusiasm, but little gets applied. So a lot of our work then is, is working alongside them while they're doing the real work, not doing the learning work. So that learning and doing are not separate activities. And how do we make sure that that's built into evaluation and um, a, a regular review processes so, so that we're not just learning, we're learning about learning and we're evaluating the value it creates. Any final questions that have come in, Chris? Or uh, no, I don't, don't seem to be. I don't know if people are, are being a bit shy today, but uh, there don't seem to be any final questions. Um, uh, if people do have questions that you want to add on uh, to now to the chat or the Q&A, then we can pick them up, or alternatively, we, we will um, um, you know, respond to them afterwards. Um, uh, we're at the top of the hour. In fact, we're slightly over the top of the hour, so um, uh, thank you, can Peter. I just, can I just also say, Chris, if there are Go. people who listen to this on recording, and it's a policy for changing the time, if people send in questions, uh, we will we'll issue a Q and A sheet with people's questions and um, so, some thoughtful responses. Absolutely, yeah. Thank you for saying that, and, and and I agree. And we will be sending out obviously the link to the uh, recording of this to everybody. Um, and uh, we've referenced a couple of things that we'll add to that. Uh, so some of the uh, sort of published case studies and so on, just so that people have got access to that kind of information. Um, the next and last one in this series is on the 3rd of July, uh, so I'm sure you'll get a, an invite to that, but you might want to think about probably at 2 o'clock UK time, in fact I think it is at 2 o'clock UK time uh, on the 3rd of July. Do you want to say, uh, Peter, do you, in terms of what, you, what you're looking to cover in that last session? Well, well in the last one it would be, be great to have questions that would come up for the previous sessions as well, but we're yeah. particularly going to go on to talk more about tomorrow's leadership. And, and how are we different from today's leadership? And, and where are we going to be citing some of the best examples of where leadership development is, is becoming future fit? Yeah, fantastic. Okay. So thank you for today. Thank you, everybody that's joined the session. And uh, I hope you've enjoyed it and got something from it. If you want to offer us any feedback, obviously, you're very welcome to, uh, to, to do so. We'd love to hear from you. And if you've got other questions to follow up, then again, feel free to, uh, to get in touch. Uh, it's been a pleasure and uh, look forward to uh, connecting with you all again soon. So I'll thank, thank you. you. Thank you and say goodbye.